Let's talk more about these markets today and this inversion. It's our top story. Uh, the yield curve inverted today for the first time since 2007, signaling that the U.S. could be headed for a recession. The relationship is the most closely watched section of the yield curve. It's inverted before each of the last seven recessions. Joining us now, today's panel, Henny and Walsh, Asset Management President and Chief Investment Officer Kevin Mann, and Yahoo Finance's Brian Chung. Also joining us from Irvine, California, Allianz Chief Economic Advisor, Mohammed El Arian. Mohammed, it's always great to see you, and especially so on a day when we have a lot of confusion and consternation in the market because you're very good at sort of breaking it down, helping people understand it. So, how alarmed should investors be about this inversion? So, they should be alarmed to the extent that this can create a self feeding expectation on the economic side. That is, this is a traditional signal of recession, therefore recession is coming, therefore the consumer cuts back, business cuts back, and next thing you know, we slow down. I don't think this should be treated as a traditional signal because the yield curve is heavily distorted by two things. One, negative rates in Europe, and we've now got 16 trillion, Julie, 16 trillion dollars of bonds trading at negative yields because of what's happening in Europe. And the second distortion is this unhealthy codependence between markets and the Fed. So I think the traditional signal is not as valid as the distortions are in driving the yield curve. Um, Mohammed, I'm curious, you brought up the Fed and we know that they're all gonna be meeting next week in Jackson Hole for the annual conference, the Kansas City Fed. What do you think they're going to be saying publicly? We're gonna have a lot of comments. Will they even address this? Will they say remain calm, all is well? Adam, I don't know even what we should hope for because they have tended to slip when it comes to communication. I think that their feel for market technicals is not as strong as it used to be. And that's why we've had these major slips in the last year or so. Um, I think if you look inside what they're thinking, they're going to be worried about three things. One is, why did they so maldiagnose both markets and the global economy? in the last quarter of last year, and how do they get out of that hole? Secondly, what do you do when markets are forcing you to do something, but the economy doesn't justify it? Mm -hmm. And thirdly, what do you, how do you operate with great uncertainty about trade policy? This is a really tough environment for central banks. It's tough for the Fed. It's 100 times tougher for the ECB, by the way. Hey, Mohammed, Brian Chung here. So on that point, then, after the Fed meets in Jackson Hole, they will have another FOMC meeting in September. It seems like markets are betting on whether or not we'll get 25 basis points or 50 basis points. Now, what does the yield curve tell you about, A, whether or not the 25 basis point cut that was done in July was good enough, and B, what the next move should be, given that the Fed's mandate isn't necessarily to steepen the yield curve, but that obviously the yield curve is telling them something maybe endogenous about what else is going on in the economy? So thanks for bringing that up, because the Fed is being forced now not only to cut 25 basis points in September, but under increasing pressure to cut 50 basis points in September. And that's coming at the same time as the narrative has evolved. I find it fascinating. It used to be, look, the Fed can't do much about the economy, but it can bolster asset prices. It evolved to, I'm not so sure that the Fed can even bolster asset prices, given what's happening elsewhere. Now, there's increasing talk about a Fed, Fed cut sending the wrong signal. So the Fed is really put in a corner. One, it can't resist the market too much, otherwise the market will punish the economy. But two, even if it moves, it will have very little impact on the economy and it may actually be problematic for financial markets. So the Fed and other central banks are increasingly being put in a corner. By the way, it's not their fault. It's simply that they've carried the burden of policymaking for too long. So they're in a tough spot, and I think investors are in a tough spot here, Mohammed, because not only do they have the inversion to contend with, they have the Fed and other central banks to contend with, and we haven't even brought up trade yet, by the way, and tariffs, which are another uh, steep hill for them to climb in terms of figuring out what to do. So what should investors do? Should they sort of ignore all of this and just stay long U.S. stocks and stay the course? <laughs> 
So, you know, that's a really um, complicated question. I think there's a few things you can deduce with a relatively high level of conviction. One is you're going to get disruptions in various related asset classes. So, so look at emerging markets. Look what's hap been happening there. Look at what's been happening in certain parts of, of the high yield market. So the first thing is you will get opportunities, but they're going to be opportunistic and mainly due to dislocations. The second is do not fade the U.S. In trade. In particular, don't be tempted to reduce U.S. exposure in favor of European exposure, as some people are telling you to do. The U.S. is still better off economically. Finally, there's a lot happening in the private credit markets. Um, so if you have someone who can structure these things well, which means that you have hedges that are built in, there are opportunities. But if all you rely on is the public markets and all you rely on are the broad indices, I think you want to take down risk at this point. Hey, Mohammed, Kevin Mon here. I, I agree with you that this may, in fact, be a false indicator of an upcoming or pending recession. But let's say it is an accurate indicator. On average, it takes 20 to 22 months for the onset of a recession after the yield curve inverts. And on average, the S&P rises about 12 percent the year after the yield curve inverts. So with that being the case, and with the underlying economic growth slowing but still growing, with the consumer still relatively confident, why would the Fed need to cut rates in that environment just to appease the markets? Yeah, I think if you look at traditional signals, um, including what you just cited, um, it's hard to argue that the Fed should cut from these levels. Um, you know, the, the economy is OK. And even if we're going to slow down, it's not clear that rate cuts do anything um, to bolster the economy. You need other pro-growth policies. However, Kevin, the problem is what happens to the markets if the Fed doesn't? It got a real scare in the fourth quarter of last year. Why? Because suddenly the tail the markets could start shaking the dog, which is the economy. And what they're worried about is a financial disruption undermining economic confidence. Remember, fundamentals are down here, asset prices are up here. They've been elevated by all this unconventional policy. So they're worried about asset prices not just coming down so with fundamentals, but pushing fundamentals down. That's why they're going to cut. It's not because of traditional argument. It's because they're being held hostage by markets. Well, let's talk about one of the things that kind of is, uh, you know, pointing in their direction. That's Germany's economy. It shrank in the second quarter, and China reported weak data, sharpening fears of slowing global growth as the trade war between the United States and China drags on. We want to continue the discussion with the panel and Mohammed about how, how all of this plays into not only what the Fed is considering, but how I as an investor need to consider where I'm going to be putting money. I mean, when you heard the data out of China and Germany, you weren't surprised, were you? And if you were, what did surprise you? I wasn't. I've been warning for a while now that Europe is the systemically most vulnerable area. Be careful of what I call stall speed, which means growth goes down so much that you can't keep other things healthy anymore. And we met, and Germany is the powerhouse economy in Europe. Germany is supposed to be the most predictable, most robust. And we've had, as you said, a second quarter of contraction. So Europe is very much the sick person of the world. China is a little bit trickier um, because they're still growing even less. The problem with China is that there's a trade-off now between short-term stimulus, which they're tempted to do, and long-term reforms. And the more they do on the stimulus front, the more they undermine the long-term reforms. So China is also getting structurally imbalanced. It just tells you that the US is so far by you know, the better place in terms of economic momentum and economic robustness. So, Mohammed, you say that the U.S. is kind of the, the brighter spot at the moment in a, what might look like a dark world, but we've seen that other central banks around the world have been lowering rates, Thailand, New Zealand, uh, India. So it raises the question about how close we might expect the Fed to get back down to zero and what that might do to Treasuries, right? We've seen that we're at 1.61, I think, on the 10-year. Should we expect a world where we're actually going to see negative yields on U.S. debt? Um, if we do... I'm going to be really worried because negative yields in the U.S., the world's biggest financial market, will break things. 
the system is not built to operate with negative yields. Negative yields take away the provision of long-term financial protection products. You cannot offer good life insurance. You cannot have a good retirement plan at negative yields. So that makes the consumer, the household, much more risk averse. Negative yields start breaking things in the banking system. Negative yields have huge implications for how the economy operates. So if we get to negative yields, this is really worrisome. And the Fed has to worry about that because we can get there if the Fed lowers interest rates too quickly. Mm -hmm. The ECB made that mistake and they can't get out of it. And the Fed has to be careful not to make the same mistake. So, Mohammed, given all of the risks that we've been talking about over the past few moments, what is the risk of a shock to global markets? Or do you think we're just going to continue to see the sort of bouncing around? So the good news, Julie, and there is good news, is one, the source of the big shock in 2008, the payments and settlement system, the ability of people to trust their counterpart, that risk is very low. Central banks learned a very painful lesson in 2008, and the payments and settlement system is very robust. The second bit of good news is that the banks that transmit shocks are in a good place in the U.S. So you won't get what I call the sudden stop, what people worry about most, the loss of trust in financial markets that then brings everything to a standstill. But we have another risk that I think is totally underestimated, and that is the liquidity risk. Because of the ample and predictable provision of liquidity by central banks for years, the system has promised too much liquidity to the end users. So there's a lot of illiquid pockets in liquid instruments. And that's the mismatch I worry about most. So be careful how much illiquidity risks you've taken in a liquid instrument, in ETFs, for example, offered on the non-liquid segments of the markets. All right, a good closing warning for investors. Thank you so much. Uh, great to get time with you. Mohammed Al-Aryan is Chief Economic Advisor at Allianz. Thanks, Mohammed.